Hello, film. Uh, so first, happy Friday. Um, hope these past two weeks have gone well for you. And hopefully, um, I'll see you Monday. Um, for your test over Casablanca that will unlock on Monday. Since I haven't really uh, heard any anything from you or uh, had any specific questions or topics people have addressed, I'm just going to give a general overview of just some important things to bear in mind for all five topics. Uh, just to remind you about the format for the test. It is a, an essay test. Uh, you'll have five prompts to choose from, um, and you'll need to pick and respond to three. Uh, again, does not matter what three you pick, does not matter um, which ones or which order you do them in, uh, but you have to do three. So, um, and this, and it will be on Canvas, it'll be take home, open note. So not meant to be that uh, difficult or that crazy. Anyway, uh, so let's get into this. The first prompt you can respond to uh, concerns foil characters and the, the film, how the film uses foil characters to help develop themes. So first off, just to review, a foil character is a character who contrasts with another character to highlight particular qualities of the other character. Um, the whole point of a foil character, uh, generally they're a foil to the main character. And the point of them is to emphasize important character traits of the main character uh, that the storyteller wants the audience to know. A uh, prime example of foil characters for more recent stuff would be uh, Harry Potter and Draco Malfoy. Uh, though they're foils because while they're both the same age, they're both students in Hogwarts, and they're both pretty talented at magic and good at school. But the big difference is Harry is a Gryffindor and is uh, just an overall nice kid who's selfless, cares about other people, and treats other people with respect. And Malfoy is a Slytherin who is selfish, does not really care about other people, and is generally just pretty rude and demeaning to uh, other people uh, if they can't help him get what he wants. Uh, so if we're looking at Casablanca, uh, probably the most obvious pair of foil characters in this would be Rick and Victor. Um, so their similarities, they're both of a similar age. Uh, they both have a similar political beliefs and backgrounds. Again, they both they both have a background of opposing fascism. Uh, again, Rick with his uh, uh, arms smuggling to the Ethiopians in their war against Italy um, and his uh, participation uh, in the span in the uh, Spanish Civil War against Franco's fascists. And then Laszlo, his uh, resistance activity uh, against the Nazis in Czechoslovakia. Um, and also, the, probably the biggest similarity, they both love Ilsa. However, their big, the big difference between these two, Rick is a cynic and Victor is an idealist. Rick has kind of given up hope that, um, that fascism can be stopped and that the world will be uh, will become a better place, whereas Victor has never lost that hope and is still uh, fully dedicated to the fight against fascism and the Nazis and trying to make the world a better place. So in the difference between them, uh, the film highlights and further develops the theme of idealism versus cynicism, where again, you've got a sick and an idealist, who are otherwise similar in a lot of ways, um, basically interacting. Um, and in certain ways, uh, at least in their uh, love for Ilsa, kind of in competition, since they both love Ilsa. Okay. Uh, the second prompt concerns the film's... 
There we go. It concerns the film's depiction of women and uh, racial minorities. Uh, so to try and get a sense of how the film depicts women and uh, by extension understand how the society at the time viewed women, um, Ilsa, looking at how Ilsa is portrayed is going to be our best bet. There are a couple of other significant women, most notably um, Yvonne, Rick's girlfriend at the beginning. Um, but the biggest issue with uh, Yvonne, Yvonne is that um, she's not really developed a lot. She's very much a side character. And we only ever really see her interact extensively with Rick. And a lot of Rick's behavior towards uh, Yvonne, you can kind of uh, view as more of a sign of his character and less of a sign of uh, the cultural norms at the time. So Ilsa is a better bet to get a sense of how the cult and society viewed women. Uh, so ultimately, Ilsa's characterization, she's characterized as being um, generally over-emotional. Uh, somebody in class, you know, some, I forget which one of you mentioned it, but somebody had mentioned that like um, she looks like she's always or almost always on the verge of tears. So yeah, like she cries a lot. She has a number of like big kind of dramatic moments, you know, uh, like in the flashback. Uh, in the past, people have just straight up laughed when she's uh, when like they hear the uh, the German guns in. Uh, the, the German guns approaching Paris, and Ilsa's just like, is that cat on fire? My heart pounded. Like, she's rather over dramatic at times. Um, the other major trait that we see with Ilsa is that she's portrayed as being very dependent on men. Um, there are moments when she does take some of her own agency. Probably the best example of that, when she's actually acting independently, being when she goes to threaten Rick to get the letters of transit. But ultimately, she defers to men when it comes to decision-making. Uh, again, the, the last third of the movie, um, or the last portion of the movie, she straight up tells Rick that he needs to think for her and that she does not really... She's, not, she's kind of done making her own decisions and that she will um, have Rick think for her and... Uh, just make her decisions for her. And the other thing, I forgot to write this down, but the other important notion of how Elsa is depicted and characterized is that the main character trait, or the main trait that people always comment on with Elsa in universe is her beauty. Every major male character who comments on her, or whenever they're talking about her or describing her, the one thing they always say is that um, she's beautiful. And they don't really mention anything else. So um, we, we can see a, an emphasis on the physical attributes of women at the time in this movie. Uh, moving on to how the film depicts uh, African Americans. Our only African American character in this movie is Sam, Rick's piano player. And if we're going to look at Sam, the way Sam interacts with people and is interacted with, um, by and large, Sam is deferential and subservient, uh, to other people. Not in, like, a not in necessarily a very obvious way, but, um, if you pay attention to the way he interacts with other, uh, white characters, he is very deferential towards them. Again, um, he always refers to Rick as... Uh, Mr. Rick, her boss, always calls Ilsa Miss Ilsa. Um, again, showing a degree of deference towards these characters that in this society would be viewed as his social superiors uh, because they're white. Um, we also have his, uh, when regarding the subservience part, we have his role in the story. Uh, again, he's Rick's piano player. His role is basically entertainment for the overwhelmingly white clientele of Rick's Cafe Americaine. Uh, Sam is generally well-respected by uh, the white clientele, but he's not viewed as an equal. Again, 
as I said before, I think that Sam and Rick are legitimately friends. And that they do truly care about each other and like each other and view each other as friends. But this is not a friendship of equals. Sam and Rick do not view each other as equals. Again, Sam is Sam definitely views Rick as his boss first. Or rather, um, he never stops viewing Rick as his boss, even when they're um, alone and acting as friends. Last major thing to point out about Sam, um, he's characterized as being pretty cheerful, upbeat, uh, but also really supportive and helpful. Again, he's a good friend. He's a really good friend who does seem to truly care about Rick and Ilsa. But if we broaden this out to look at how that role fits in the story, his role in this story is fundamentally there to help support uh, the needs and development of uh, the white main character, Rick. Um, if you notice, again, um, all of his dialogue, everything that he, um, all of his actions are related to trying to help Rick in some way. Probably the most um, notable scene in this regard, when he and Rick are being legitimately friends, you have Sam there trying to cheer Rick up and get him to stop thinking about Ilsa and getting him to, get, to try and get him to leave uh, so he won't stop thinking about Ilsa. Which, again, I think does highlight how they view each other as friends. But also the fact that all of Sam's interactions with Rick kind of fall into that vein. Um, it does also show and potentially reflect a broader societal uh, view of the status and the role of African-Americans in uh, American society at that time. Moving on to prompt three over corruption. Not a whole lot I'm going to talk about here. Um, just the big takeaway with how this film develops the theme of corruption is that corruption is just normalized in Casablanca. Uh, when in the city of Casablanca, corruption is just a part of everyday life. Everyone engages in corruption. Everyone has to do some illegal or shady stuff just to get by uh, in this city in this time. You have both good characters and bad characters engaging in corruption. And it has both good and bad effects. I mean, on the one hand, again, you have uh, Louis and Strasser who murder Ugarte in jail uh, and then turn around and falsify a report saying that he either uh, committed suicide or was killed trying to escape. Uh, so there you have bad corruption where you have uh, the authorities um, just murdering people and lying about it. But then on the other hand, you have more positive effects of corruption where you have like, um, well, the letters of transit being stolen in the first place. You have the black market for exit visas and how you can bribe Louis or how it's possible to just bribe Louis to get an exit visa and get out. Um, you even have Rick um, rigging a roulette table to help that young couple get the money they need to buy an exit visa uh, on the black market to get out of Casablanca. So you have corruption occurring for both good and bad effects. Uh, both good and bad characters engaging in corruption. And ultimately, it's just a normalized part of everyday life. Okay, looking at prompt four over the relationship between character arcs and themes, specifically for this one, you're going to have to respond to Rick's character arc. Not going to go into a whole lot of detail here because I've already given a detailed breakdown in a previous video of Rick's character arc. Um, but by and large, the big takeaway thematically is that Rick's character arc develops the theme of cynicism versus idealism because he starts out as a cynic and then changes over the course of the story to be an idealist. 
And the fact that Rick starts as a cynic but ends as an idealist, um, that gives this movie, or rather the movie kind of uses that transformation to ultimately endorse idealism over cynicism or encourage people to be idealistic instead of cynical because our main character starts as a cynic but ends as an idealist. Um, so if you are responding to that one, you will need to give a more detailed explanation of Rick's character arc. But again, I've already done that in a previous video, so I'm not going to do that now. Just to try and keep this short. And then looking at the last prompt about the relationship between setting and tone and theme. So I think there are two notable settings to pay attention to here. One is the city of Casablanca itself, which is generally a pretty chaotic and hectic place. Um, there's not really a stable source of authority. The authority figures are corrupt. There's a black market. There's underground activity everywhere. Um, on top of that, the authorities themselves don't um, consistently follow or enforce the law. They're terribly corrupt. So ultimately, the fact that there's no stable authority kind of helps develop the theme of corruption just through the setting. Um, where there's just so much um, shady stuff and illicit activity going on that it basically just surrounds, everyone is just kind of surrounded with corruption all the time. Also, the city of Casablanca has this kind of desperate attitude towards it. Um, because, again, you have a lot of these refugees who are stuck there, and they're trying to get out, but they can't. Um, so you have these people that are kind of, you've got a mix of people who are simultaneously clinging on to hope that they'll somehow manage to make it to Casablanca, and also people who have given up hope and have just accepted that they're going to be stuck here for who knows how long. Um so with that sense of desperation, you kind of got some development of cynicism versus idealism there. Um, moving on to the other main setting of the movie is Rick's Cafe Americaine, um, which has a number of the same traits as the city of Casablanca itself, but a couple of important ways that they're... Um, developed at Rick's. First off, I, I kind of view Rick's Cafe as having this facade of respectability that conceals a lot of underlying illicit activity. So basically what I mean by that is that on the surface, Rick's Cafe looks like a nice, respectable place, looks like it'd be a pretty cool club uh, to go to, can have a drink, uh, sit around, listen to some music, be entertained, just kind of relax and chill out for an evening. But if you look a little deeper, you'll see there's a lot of illegal stuff going on there. For one hand, you've got the illegal gambling den in the back. Um, but also, you've got a lot of the resistance groups who meet there and the black market dealers who conduct business there. Um, so there's a lot of underlying corruption, but it's just, but unlike in the rest of Casablanca, where it's just kind of out in the open, it ricks there's kind of this um, veneer of, no, everything's fine, it's, it's fine, uh, over everything. But in reality, it's still just as corrupt as the rest of Casablanca. The other interesting trait about Ritz is that there's kind of this attitude of like a tense calm, where even though things are pretty calm, there's kind of this underlying tension there that will rise up and burst at certain moments. Uh, good examples of that, you have Ugarte's arrest, where there's a high outburst of tension, and then once it's over, everything just calms down. You've got the, um, the French officer and the German officer getting in a fight over Yvonne. You've got the, uh, the Marseillais being sung in protest to the Germans singing uh, Die Wacht am Rhein. Uh, so you've got, there, there's always like this undercurrent of tension, even when Rick meets, uh, Strasser and Strasser goes to talk to Laszlo on that first night there. Um, 
he doesn't Strasser doesn't necessarily do anything overtly menacing uh, and still contributes to the fact that this place is kind of respectable. But there's kind of this underlying threat to those interactions. And again, kind of with everything else there, there's this underlying tension that could that you kind of feel could uh, bubble up at any moment. So that's my general breakdown of these three of these uh, five prompts. Again, pick three to respond to. Uh, test will unlock on Monday. Next week, we'll start moving into our uh, second movie. And uh, with that, have a good weekend, everybody.